We're here with Heritage Craft Butchers. I got my buddies Bob and Jared, and they're gonna show us how to break down pig primals into all the cuts that you love. If you missed the first two videos in this series, make sure to check that playlist out. You can click right there to follow the whole playlist. Guys, what do we do with these primals? I'll get out of your way. All right, cool. All right, so we've got the rack of uh, pork loin here. Um, when the ribs end, you've got your boneless pork chops. Um, you can butterfly those. You'll see those later. I'll do a couple butterflies. Um, but I'm going to separate them here, and then we will chine the spine off of this, and we'll have some nice, beautiful bone-in pork chops. So I'm going to start right at that last rib. Separate. Some more chiropractic action here. All right, so that'll be... You'll take off the spine, and you'll be left with these beautiful uh, boneless pork chops. Can you tell us what chining means, Jared? <clears throat> chining is when you, uh, I'll show you, I'll do it in action. So chining would be just removing the actual spine, the, the vertebrae, um, leaving the uh, rib bones intact. So you kind of go in at an angle. When you're sawing, you want to slow down when it starts to get a little quieter because you don't really want to be cutting through meat with your saw. So now I've gotten through the bones and I will remove the vertebrae along with those feather bones that run right along the top of the spine, right along the backbone, that mohawk of the pig. So that guy there, all gone. Clean up the, uh, any remnants of bones or cartilage might be left in that fat along the top end. Then we're left with this beautiful, uh, basically rack of, of pork. And we will cut these pork chops. We like to cut them nice and thick. So when I cut in between the ribs, I usually go against the rib, the following rib, so. Nice big pork chops. <laughs> we don't do small chops or small steaks around here. If we lay it out, you can see how the musculature changes from the front of the pig to the back. This fat is very sticky. After we get one, one more. Get one more off of those. And then uh, behind the ribs, like whenever you're, you're out of actual rib bones down there, usually we'll take the, the rest of the spine off of those and uh, cut those into boneless pork chops or butterfly chops, open them up that way. Cool. Nice. So you want me to move on to the shoulder now? Yeah. All, All right. right, cool. So uh, what I'm going to break down this pork shoulder, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull off basically a boneless flap, very similar to like a pork brisket, but it'll be something that we could stuff and roll, as well as uh, the copa, which is the, uh, the, the, the cluster of muscles right behind the pig's head. Um, that's a wonderful uh, uh, cut to cure. We make um, myriad copa flavors. You have your traditional, uh, your copa seca, your sweet copa, your spicy copas. Um, caraway copa, we've done General So's copa, uh, um, oh, cardamom and black pepper copa, like any type of uh, flavors um, that that will take in is, is great. Now, um, somewhat interesting thing about pigs, I mean, they don't have like a collarbone, a clavicle that connects the, uh, the sternum uh, to the shoulders. So this big mass of bone here, the ribs and like the neck bones can just sort of be excised from the animal and pulled off in one uh, piece like this, uh, revealing you know pretty much the cross section of the, the shoulder of the pig here. Now, when we look at 
these uh, ribs, you get like little cartilaginous flexible uh, pieces down here where the, where the sternum hasn't fused together yet. If we took that whole rack of ribs off and took that lower portion that has just a little bit of bone, but mostly those softer little plasticky uh, connectors in there, and if you have some pork belly on the outside, that would be like your spare ribs, which is another fun little term. You know why they're called spare ribs? You always wonder this? Yeah. Well, because there's the leftover ribs. No, because think about when this animal is alive. It needs all those ribs. They're not. They're not extras, right? They're not in the trunk. We'll go back to oh, like the fourth. Let's go 365 AD, Central Europe. When you're getting close to like the fall of the Roman Empire, you have the Germanic tribes pressing south down through Gaul and the Balkans and, and taking advantage of a weakened world power. Um, they were traditionally, these are like the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, they weren't traditionally like a nomadic people. They weren't like the, the Scythians or the Huns or later the Mongols. Um, they were a barbarian horde. And to mobilize their entire society to take advantage of this opportunity that they had to topple the Roman Empire, they would uproot entire towns, men, women, children, the elderly, farm animals, everything, and they'd press, press on. So, uh, one of the cuts of pork, when they would slaughter a pig to feed an army that was out pillaging and marauding, or whatever, whatever terms you would use to describe it, you would take the entire uh, breastplate of the pig off. You'd take this lower section of the ribs with that pork belly con connected. Uh, I'm gonna use this pork belly as a, as a visual aid here. This wouldn't be the cut itself because it would have the ribs attached to it. But what you do is you plant a spear in the ground, or like a semicircle of spears with a fire in the middle, and drape that big floppy piece of pork over it, and let it roast there, offset for hours at a time. You know, you know, indirect heat for six hours, eight hours, ten hours, whatever. And whenever your soldiers would return from their campaign, they would have a very calorie dense cut of pork to feed themselves with. That cut was uh, in the time at the time called the Rippespear. Right? It was the spear rib. It was the rib that was cooked on a spear. Oh. And then over time, that gets bastardized and changed from spear rib to spare rib. So now you can go to the grocery store and you can purchase a big flap of pork ribs. that has its uh, etymological origin in the fall of the Great Roman Empire. I These guys should start a podcast. Comment below if you don't agree that. That's a great story right there. I think that's one of the more fun facts of this thing. Couple little sound effects and... Oh yeah? Oh yeah. Like a, like a sword being shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we took we took that massive bone off of here. So what we have to do is get some actual like product out of this sh shoulder. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take out um, the, the the copa uh, muscle. Now this is you know the copa we call it copa because that's what it's called. But similar products uh, products of other names. You have your capicola, which can also be uh, this this cured. Um, shoulder muscle. It's also uh, can be made into a basically a salami that's also called capicola. Um, gabagool is a bastardization of the word copa, right? So whenever you had um, a lot of Italian immigrants in the early 20th century, late 19th century coming into like New York and you know opening their little ethnic neighborhood grocery stores and going down, you know, they were going down to buy capicola. The Irish and the Scots and the German uh, residents who didn't understand what these words were um, just sort of uh, applied a phonetic uh, term to it. It's like capicola became gabagool, etc. But anyway, this is the, cap the copa muscle. We'll trim like the fat up on this. We'll use that fat in like salamis or something because as this cures and dries, um, the, the, the muscle portion of this is gonna shrink down and, and kind of retract a little bit, whereas the fat is gonna stay pretty much this size all the way through. And we don't want that much of a fat cap on the copa because we're gonna shave that super thin, paper thin, if you will, and make a fantastic uh, dry cured product out of that. So here's our copa that we're gonna set down here. Now, right underneath of the copa is a, is a unique and high value uh, cut of pork called the pressa. And if you look, if you can see the actual, as it's still connected to the pig here, 
is where you have all these muscle striations that sort of run uh, parallel to each other. It's very, it's reminiscent of brisket. Like brisket has all these muscle fibers that run in one direction with some marbling in between. This is um, a muscle that's cut right underneath of uh, the, the shoulder blade. The shoulder blade is right behind this. So what we can do is we can tease this off of the shoulder blade. This is called the pressa. And this is one of like the three traditional um, uh, Spanish butcher's cuts. You have the pressa, the secreto, which is like a triangular shaped piece of meat down here in the bottom, and the pluma, which is a uh, feather shaped muscle that runs along the inside of the copa there. Those are cuts that are, are very good, have a good texture, great flavor, um, but aren't, they don't have a lot of like retail value because there's only two of each of them on the pig. They're not a very heavy weight and most people just don't know what they are. So those muscles would be just trimmed off and taken home by the, uh, the proprietor of the charcuteria or whatever. So here's our, um, our press of muscle. This is fantastic. Salt and pepper grilled at a high heat to a medium doneness, a little bit pink in the middle, and then sliced across the grain. It's fantastic. You can serve it to somebody, and if you don't tell them that it's pork, they will assume that it is uh, sirloin or uh, flat iron or Denver steak or something like that. <laughs> I got a question. Sure. I'm watching you guys cut out those different parts there mm -hmm. uh, from, that's a shoulder, right? Yes. And I'm used to, when I'm like deboning a deer, it's, it's kind of easy, right? You follow the silver skin and it yep. kind of shows you where the muscles. This looks a lot more confusing to me. Is there a guide as you're cutting that shows you where to be cutting or is it just your, you know, years of doing it? Sort of. Um, on one hand, you know, like once you, okay, so right here, this little intersection here, there's a bunch of veins, there's a bunch of muscles that come together. This is where, there, there's a joint under there. This is where the ball and socket joint of the shoulder is. The shoulder blade is basically a shovel shaped bone that ends in a cup. And then the humerus bone is, you know, your upper arm bone that ends in a ball. That happens right behind all of these veins and arteries and stuff like that. Above this point, pretty much the only bone you have to worry about is that shoulder blade. Uh, we, took, we took the ribs and the spine off. So from here up, the only bone that's in here is this guy. So we can remove that and cut this, you know, this giant uh, flap of meat off to use as like a rolled boneless pork shoulder. Um, but that's, that's the main one, is just finding where that, where that joint is and then everything on the lower end of the, uh, end of the leg will end up being like your, your pork shanks, uh, you know, like we could do, um, there's a, when we get down there, I'll talk about a product that we do make out of that, or we have made out of that, um, um, that forearm meat. But once you get down here, you find the, uh, where that ball and socket joint is, and then you can just sort of tease around it a little bit, cut some of that connective tissue. This one is very forgiving. There is nothing holding that joint together aside from the stuff that's around it. So I'm just trying to get down there and, and get that cut um, kind of close to the bone. You can, you can give it a little push to open the joint up and cut around there. Now when we get back into the ham, it's a very similar joint back there with the, uh, the, hip, the hip, the ball and socket that forms the hip. That one, however, has like an actual cord of connective tissue um, that joins one bone into the other, which isn't, it's not difficult to cut, um, but you do sort of have to, like if you have a, a, a socket there in the ball, you gotta get that knife in there and kind of follow the contours. That. That's why I like to have like a semi-flex boning knife for whenever you're going in between bones, you're not just like pushing a rigid piece of metal um, against that and uh, yeah, fighting the, 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 what would that be, the tensile strength of steel? Tensile, Bueller, Bueller. All right. So now, when we remove the shoulder blade, you can do this real clean. Like you really spend some time, um, you know, getting it out of there. You know, bright white and pristine. When you're not on camera. When you're not on camera. When you're not saying lots of words about. Uh, the Roman Empire and, uh, <laughs> and pigs and whatever else. So really, I'm just gonna pull this guy out of here it's, and then we'll trim it later. We'll take all this stuff off of the, um, the, the, the anterior portion of the shoulder blade and that'll go into like our sausage grind and stuff like that. But yeah, 
get that out. Now, so that's our shoulder blade. And this is like, this is that joint that I was looking at. So right here you have a nice clean socket joint and buried down in the shoulder here under this flap is the ball that it was attached to. So that's uh, just like a sixth grade anatomy uh, textbook. The arm bones connected to the shoulder bone. Yada, 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 yada. All right, so what we're gonna do here is pull the rest of this shoulder flap off. And this is great for, um, for doing like a, a rolled and tied uh, pork roast because you still, like we removed the copa, which is a, a high value muscle for like long, slow smoking or, or braising or whatever. But we still have all of these layers. You know, you have fat and meat and fat and meat and all this stuff. And let me just get the portion of the jowl off here. So, but this can be stuffed with stuffing, apples, other, other meats, uh, flavoring agents or whatever. If you're enjoying this, you can actually book your friends and your family a private pig butcher party. Click the link that just popped up in the corner of the video. That'll take you over to our website where you can learn more about the Heritage Craft Butchers and their live butcher shows. Check them out. Let's get back to pig butchering. All right, so yeah, with that um, sort of this boneless shoulder flap, this is great to, you can stuff it with anything you want, tie it up into a nice long uh, log and cinch that down real tight. That'll cook low and slow. It can be grilled rotisserie. You can braise that or whatever. And then the last part of that uh, pork shoulder is basically the front leg. The lower or the upper half of this would be um, essentially your picnic ham. Doesn't have a fun anecdote to go along with it. It's just a, uh, if you made a ham out of this, it would be a casual style ham that you might eat at a picnic lunch. Uh, but other than that, you have, you know, your, your shanked out the bottom there. Um, in the past, we've made a product out of this that is from northern Italy. It's called Tano di Miale, which is just a straight uh, translation meaning tuna pork. Um, these muscles down the lower leg are really kind of gnarly and tough, but have a lot of flavor in them. Every every step that the pig takes um, pretty much um, saturates this with oxygen-rich blood and, and, and works those muscle fibers. So if we cut all that off and um, like cure it in kosher salt for 24 hours and then simmer it in white wine and water and bay leaf for four to six hours. And then when it comes out of that, it cools. Um, rather than, now see at that point you could pull it like pulled pork, but we wouldn't do that. We just sort of take it and, and fluff out the, um, the muscle fibers, kind of like you're like you're, you're fluffing up a cotton ball and then pack that in olive oil. It's gonna have a flavor and a texture very similar to canned tuna. Um, in Southern Italy, where you have access to the Mediterranean, in the spring or the fall, I don't know what time of the year they do this, but they hang these nets. They make these corridors out of nets in the water and they drive tuna through them. And as the tuna go through these corridors, they come up to the surface and they're waiting there in, in rowboats and they beat them to death with oars and they hook them and they pull them in. So you have tons of tuna available along the Mediterranean coast of Italy. But once you get up into like Tuscany and you know, the Alpine regions and the foothold, foothills of the Alps and the Pyrenees or whatever, um, you don't have as much uh, you don't have as much sea available whenever you're in the inland. So um, uh, this knockoff tuna product is actually better than the real thing, and it's fantastic. But it it's, looks uh, like tuna. It does. It looks very much like tuna. So that's a fun thing that you can make out of some like tough, gnarly leg leg meat. Now, we're going to get in here, work on this actual leg, this ham, the ham primal of this pig. Um, you know, we broke this down in a specific way. It's not the only way you can do it. You can break down a pig any number of ways for any number of products. There are many ways to break down a pig. There are more than one way to skin a cat, which uh, has a fun origin uh, here in Appalachia. Um, you know, you have, you have ponds and rivers and lakes and stuff like that with lots of catfish, channel cats, blue cats, uh, white cats, catfish. Catfish are a type of fish that you, yeah, yeah, you usually don't 
um, you, you skin them. You, you pull the skin off, and people will do that in different ways. You'll take the fish and slit it up the belly and around the shoulders and pull the skin off that way. You might cut the head off and cut the tail off and slit it down the back and pull it down towards the belly. You might just um, cut two fillets off of either side and pull that skin off. You might even nail the head to a board, cut around the gills, and strip the whole thing. But there's many ways to skin a catfish, thus more than one way to skin a cat, right? Don't know if that's true, but boy, did it sound good. Uh, everything that Jared just trimmed off of that leg, yep. sausage? Indeed. Yeah, we, uh, we make a lot of sausage, so we don't do a lot of picnic hams. So we're just trimming everything. Going to go into the sausage bucket. It's going to be delicious kimchi sausage, breakfast sausage. Hot Italian, uh, sweet yeah, Italian. Hot and sweet, but we do some fancy sausage. Salamis also. Kim's Greek kalamata. Yeah, that, that's a big, big winner, the kimchi I'm sausage. Good. That? You guys got any? I believe so. All right, that's going to go Theoretically, on. it's pretty good. It's my wife's favorite, you know. So what I'm going to do here is um, we need to trim up this ham so that we can produce a couple of cuts, one of which will be the pork sirloin roast, which is my personal favorite pork roast. Uh, another will be the actual uh, ham that we will do as a boneless brined holiday-style Easter ham, and the last will be the ham hock that comes off of the bottom there. Now, I'm going to take this sirloin roast off of the top of the, the ham of the pig. And uh, when we do this, again, it's another one of those things where if I would just shut up and cut it off of here, it would be much more complete and pretty. But I can't stand any dead air, so I'm just going to talk the whole time. And we're going to see if we can pull it off and make it look... Uh, somewhat presentable and even if it isn't presentable Jared's going to use his magic fingers to tie it up real tight to make it uh, You know suitable for a Bon Appetit magazine or the William Sonoma catalog whatever because Most of butchery is not the cutting but the tying you Gotta take it apart and then put it back together in some aesthetically pleasing way we kind of just get down here around the, the pelvic bones and get this big horseshoe crab shaped lump of pork off. There we go. Beautiful. And what I like about this is that it has a real thick fat cap with lots with the end the tail end of the loin muscle plus like the top top muscles of the ham so you get a little bit of those like muscle layers in there but if you tie it up you make this nice little cylinder of meat um, it will take heat very well without breaking down and turning into pulled pork so you can actually just like slice it like a loin roast um, without actually sacrificing like pork chops there now you got to watch this I'm not this is the one time I am actually going to shut up because this is mesmerizing. I'll get your knives out the way. Standard butcher's knot. If you know if you know how to do it, it's not that magical. But if you if, you, if you got dumb fingers like I do, it's like it's like casting a spell. Right. <laughs> it's harder to do slow. You go over the thumb. That knot once it. Pops like that, you could just cut right through that whole thing. All right, we'll do it again. Essentially making a figure eight right there. Now the reason you're tying this is that it's a it's an oddly shaped piece of meat. It's real thick at one end, it tapers off and gets thin at the other end. If you just threw that into a pot or into a pan and put it in the oven, um, this tail end is going to cook very quickly. It's going to dry out. It's going to get tough. Whereas you might still have a raw center at, at the front there. So by cinching it up and tying it, you're sort of normalizing the uh, the density and the thickness from one end to the other. So by pulling it all together, it is as dense and and has as much mass right in this area as it does does up there. So that it'll it'll cook more evenly 
um, and it'll be a little bit more resilient and keep its shape in the pan. Otherwise, it's just sort of going to melt out into a big flat uh, sort of rubbery, rubbery mass there. And the key too is if you're going to be trimming a roast like this, tie it first, then cut it up. Cut it and then tie it. You're going to get some weird shapes at the end. You're going to have to do it again, and eventually you're not going to have anything left. So you get all your top, your, your your knots in there, and then you, you you square off either end. And that is my favorite pork roast by far, pork sirloin roast. Now we need to turn this into a ham-shaped ham because ham, right now it is it is a horse-shaped ham, I think. But anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to remove what's called the H bone. That is the, the, the pelvic plate with, you know, that we have the, um, um, the spine attached there, but mainly this, this big flat bone that's right down here that sits on top of the, uh, the femur up here. Now, the reason we're gonna do that, if this were like a skin on ham, um, we might be making prosciutto out of it. We salt it and then hang it to dry for 18 months, two years, whatever. Uh, but even if we're not doing that, this doesn't have the skin on, we're not going to do prosciutto. So, uh, you know, if we're going to do a brined ham, we also want to remove this bone because we need the salt to penetrate into the main mass of this leg. If, if, we're, if we leave it on there, you can have the salt penetrate and stop at the bone and then not make it through the other side. And then you'd have uncured or spoiled parts um, in the center there. So what we're going to do is just cut right along the bottom. Um, of this pelvis and we're going to find that ball and socket joint just like up in the shoulder. Now this one, as I mentioned earlier, there is a cord of connective tissue that joins that socket to the actual ball of the femur. And I always just say that that sound, that's the sound of a hundred dollar knife turning into a four dollar knife. But it's okay <laughs> because you take care of it. You, you, you hone them up, you run them, run them on the stone afterwards. But we use a little bit of leverage, a little bit of cutting, and just separate that, that um, socket from the ball, and then cut around um, the rest of the pelvis there. And then we can take this whole thing off, easy, breezy, beautiful, just like that. And here's the, that, that socket joint, and you can see where you had that cord of connective tissue in the middle where we wanted to separate that from the rest of the leg there. And you look here, it's starting to look like a ham, not quite there yet. If, like I said, if we were doing a prosciutto, what we would want to do is massage the femoral artery to make sure that there isn't any blood left in the mass of that leg. And we do is just take your forearm and run it up the inside of the pig's thigh. And right here, where you see a little bit of blood, darker blood coming out, that's right where that artery is located. So you massage it a couple times, push that blood out of there. The reason for that is that blood is a nutrient-rich medium where you can get lots of bad things growing, bacteria, fungus, whatever else. And you don't want that, that like channel of blood running down through the center mass of this or it'll rot from the inside out. It might be perfect all the way down to the last three inches and then from that, from that vein out. Um, you can get some spoilage. So you can massage it like that. You can find the actual head of the femoral artery, which it's not that difficult. Like you can see where the blood comes out and then kind of tease it out there. It'll be like a little straw. I'll see if I can actually get right, uh, push it a little bit. And sometimes it retracts. There was an episode of MASH, I believe, where they were trying to do field dress a wound. And one guy, the actual doctor, was talking to the, to the field medics over the radio and trying to tell them how to find this vein. And it was retracted up into his leg. Um, and that, that'll do that sometimes because there is tension on it. And whenever it cuts, it can slip back down in there. But anyway, if you find it, you find the opening, you can use your injector with a little bit of salt water solution, thread it into the femoral artery, shoot the water in there, and then flush it back out. And that's going to remove a lot of that blood. But the next thing, the next sort of a step here is to shape up the face of this ham. And this is a, yet again, um, we could spend a lot of time, be very anal retentive about this um, to make it absolutely perfect. But for the sake of this, I'm just trying to make a roughly ham shaped ham. This does have a practical benefit aside from just being aesthetic. And that is that if you're dry curing or if you're doing a long cure or 
a hang or something like that. You don't want too many big flappy pieces where stuff can get underneath and ferment or uh, incubate or anything like that. So by trimming this up, shaving down the face of the ham, you eliminate a lot of those little hideaways for bad stuff. But this is roughly, you know, the shape of a ham. I think this is starting to get to the point where, you know, you picture a thing that Scooby-Doo would pick up, stick in his mouth and pull out and it would be a clean bone, right? But we gotta do, we're not done. We have, we have roughly a ham shaped ham up here, but we have too much leg down here on the bottom. So what we need to do is remove this lower leg. Now this is like the, the trickiest thing. Up until now, we've been going in between a bone, cut, pull it apart, whatever. Here we have a knee joint buried way down in the center of this ham. So we need to follow the musculature to kind of terminate right, right, right behind the knee, right where we get there so that we can tease it apart with the knife. If you go an inch too shallow or an inch too deep, then you're just gonna end up directly against bone, not knowing exactly where you are. And then you're gonna be in there fiddling around for like 15, 20 minutes. And if you don't edit that out, I'll look like I don't know what I'm doing. So that's the danger. So what we gotta do is look at, look at the muscle here. We have this big muscle that kind of comes right up through this area here, right? And then the rest of the leg kind of comes down here. You get a little bit of a kneecap in this area. So if we know that if we kind of just go down, boom, 45 degree angle, right in this little kind of armpit of the, it's the rear leg of the pig, but it's kind of an armpit. We should kind of get down right about where we want to be in that joint. And if you see with your camera, we are right there. Before I pull this apart, you can see we have uh, the center mass of that joint right in here. And it may, it's, it's remarkably easy. This would be something that you would think you have to use a bandsaw for, but you just get that knife in there. And there is the bottom portion of the leg separated from the top. Bada boom, bada bang. Hota, 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 a lobster. Right, so now we're gonna remove the actual femur from the center of the ham. The reason for this is because we're gonna make a boneless Easter ham. It sounds like it would be fancier if it was the bone in, but really you're just adding work for whoever is gonna be carving this uh, for Easter dinner. If we remove the bone, we will get a much more an even cure whenever we brine this. Um, we won't have that bone in the center. The, the, the meat itself will be kind of spread out, opened up, butterflied. And then when we smoke it, we'll, we'll roll it back up and tie it so that we get a, you know, a beautiful like ham shape at the end where you can slice it off. Now to bone this out, real simple. We see this is the top of the, the bone, this is the bottom. We can just follow this where it is. Um, and then you know, if, 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 the, if the leg itself is really uh, meaty, we can remove the fioco muscle. We can cure that separately and make a nice little uh, uh, charcuterie product from it. But in general, we're just gonna yoink this bone out of here. Yeah, so right around the joint, pop this out. And the key to, I mean, the key to making the, the ham nice isn't so much this part, it's after it's been cured. And here's, you can see here's the patella, the kneecap, which floats above the rest of the knee. So we can kind of just cut, kind of cut a triangular thing there and pull that out. Because nobody, nobody wants that Easter egg in the middle of their ham. All right, get this guy out. What is that hiding in there, Bob? Is that a gland? Is that a bone? Where are we patella? looking? The patella is the kneecap. Okay. It's that yeah. bone right at the front, not connected to anything else. It just kind of moves around there. What's that called? Is it the meniscus? Is sort of the the binding capsule of uh, of. Uh, I don't think that's the right word, but sure. Uh, we're gonna call it the meniscus. <laughs> I've heard. I, I just. I, I've heard of older gentlemen having a torn meniscus in their knee, and I just assumed that that's what it was. I think that's the. The good okay. news is, Bob, if you get it wrong, nobody on YouTube will comment. And no, no. Oh, yeah. You out. know what? I oh, was... this is going on YouTube? <laughs> oh. Never mind. Can we, can we send it to Joe Rogan's Instagram? No. Um, so this looks nothing like a ham, right? This looks like a giant rectangle of floppy pork. 
But if we cure this in a brine, in a barrel, we can get a whole bunch of them in there. And it's pretty much an equal thickness from one end to the other. So we're going to get a nice penetration. It's going to get a nice hammy color and all that. When we go to smoke this, we'll create a glaze of you know, brown sugar, molasses, garlic, onion, mustard bourbon. seeds, and bourbon, and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, before we smoke these, we'll slather this on the inside and then roll it back up just like this. And then Jared will use those magic golden fingers of his to tie this up real tight. And oh my God, that looks almost ham shaped, right? So this will be tied up real tight like this, smoked, glazed on the outside. The smoking process does a couple of things. One, it does cook the product. So it makes it so that you can just eat it. You can eat a cold ham sandwich or whatever. It also imparts a lot of flavor. Uh, the smoke itself gets absorbed into the meat and gives it a nice flavor that way. Additionally, what happens whenever you slowly heat, whether it's bacon or ham or whatever, is all this fat is gonna change texture. Um, we had talked about earlier how, when we were looking at the, um, the, the leaf lard, is how the fat itself is a, it is a matrix of these little balloons full of lipids. When it heats up, a lot of those will melt and they'll collapse and all that, that, that fat will sort of just get denser. When it, when it, it does that, it's gonna be, it's gonna be warm and soft and all that. When it's refrigerated after it's been cooked, it's gonna get real solid and have a real like a firm, cold butter texture to it. And that's gonna give it a lot of structure. So if we tie it up tight, smoke it in that shape, and then chill it afterwards, you're gonna basically get a reconstituted ham um, where you would never know that a bone was ever in it if you didn't know that that would be ridiculous for it not to be the case. Oh, now let's we're- Let's put this pig back together. Let's put it, yeah, yeah, let's get some of that meat glue and rebuild this pig. It's funny how, um, hey, you're a fan of Star Wars. Uh, the Imperial Walkers, the At-Ats, kind of, you know, got a thing here, little legs. I don't know. It looks like that from my end. But anyway, yeah, there's there's our pig. So here's our pig. We have a jowl, a copa, shoulder, pressa, pork chops from one end to the other, sirloin, tenderloin, uh, leaf lard, sausage trim, uh, baby back ribs, some um, pork belly, and a ham. Ta-da! Did we forget anything? <laughs> That was a lot of fun. Somebody's gonna be like, Don't worry, baby, back ribs. You're right. You guys don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Maybe you could just, and some ribs. No, <laughs> just scramble it a little bit. The ribs. There it is. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. We got a private. A version, just the, the two of us here have been watching this presentation. I want to know if you guys watching would be interested in doing an event like this. Uh, I would love to have a homesteady meetup here at Heritage Craft Butchers. Let us know in the comments below if you would be interested in spending a night doing this with these two guys, listening to stories and uh, learning about the meat, sampling some stuff. Be a really fun time, way to get together and uh, meet some of the homesteady audience out there. Uh, so let me know in the comments below, and if enough people say you'd be interested in, we'll put something together with these guys. We'll have links below to your website, your Instagram, what else? You guys got any other social media? Facebook. Facebook, so we'll have links below to all that stuff. And uh, if you're in, where do you guys say, around Mariana, Pennsylvania? Washington County. Washington? Okay. Yeah. So if you're around Washington County, Pennsylvania, and you want to actually come or make a special trip, this place is worth a special trip. I have never seen such a cool looking butcher shop. There is all kinds of delicious stuff. And when we stop filming this, I'm going shopping. So we better close this one down, guys. Thank you, Thank you so much, guys. This was awesome. Hey, thanks Thank a lot. So it's nice to meet you guys. If you missed any of the previous videos, click right here and you can see the right. whole entire right. series. There we go. Click my face. <laughs>